Hey. In our, uh, in our American nation that uh, may not be this cold, but we are enjoying some cold weather. <laughs> there are parts of the world that are struggling with extreme heat. So uh, we are grateful for whatever it is. As long as we are alive, we certainly do thank God for God's blessings. Um, today we are going to meditate on the words of the prophet Isaiah, uh, on, the, on the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 64, the entire chapter of 64. It's not a long chapter. It only has 12 verses. So Isaiah chapter 64. Uh, I will give you time to locate that scripture. Uh, meanwhile, we are going to pray. Let us pray. Lord our God, here we are in another Wednesday, filled with joy and thanksgiving in our hearts that you have kept us thus far. Like your word says, thus far the Lord has been our help. And indeed, Lord, you have been our help thus far. And we do trust that you will continue uh, to be our support system, uh, continue to be our rock, uh, one that we can lean on. And so we are grateful. We thank you indeed for life. And we thank you, Lord, for health, even as... Uh, um, many in our church family and across our human family uh, are not doing so well health-wise. But you are still a God who is seated on the throne of power and glory and might. Uh, you are seated above and beyond. And you certainly do watch over us. And for that reason alone, Lord, we are grateful. Help us to be grateful, to be thankful to you in all things good that you do and allow us to be and to do. Now we pray blessings, special blessings for all the families that are represented on this uh, virtual session of Bible study, uh, whether at home or at work or maybe traveling, or elsewhere, we pray that every listening ear uh, may be blessed and that the work of your Holy Spirit may be real, uh, to move from listening uh, to hearing and attentively uh, hearing your will and what you, O oh God, want us to do. We pray that, Lord, you will help us to live according to your word, uh, even at times such as this, uh, when the world uh, um, has turned away from your word, and as a result, everything is upside down. We are suffering, we are struggling as a result of giving our backs unto your word. And so, Lord, we pray for your help, for your inspiration and guidance as we gather around your holy scriptures. Give us something, Lord. Give us something special tonight. Uh, give us something unique each time we gather in your name. For that is your promise. That when we gather in your name, something extraordinary out of the regular will take place in our spiritual journey. And so bless all of us today and uh, prepare our minds to engage, to connect, and to resonate with your word. These blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the word today, my friends, comes from uh, the book of the prophet Isaiah. Uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 64. The entire chapter of 64 which only has like 12 verses. Amen? So 
while you try to locate that scripture from your favorite Bible translation, I will grace you with another song uh, from many songs that uh, one of my beloved friends from St. Mark's United Methodist Church has taken the time um, to put together this music uh, uh, for us, and I thank her. So the, the, the following one that I'm going to play says, the king is coming. Uh, the king is coming. It looks like the king is coming. <laughs> Let Coming, the king is coming. 
Hallelujah. The king is coming for me. The king is coming for you. Indeed, the Christmas season that is quickly approaching is nothing but a reminder of the coming of the king. Now, this king who already came, as a matter of fact, he was born and he did all the things he did, all things good that bring honor and glory to his father our heavenly God. Uh, but yet, this same king is going to come again. And every day we look forward for the second coming of Christ. And so this song is so good. And of course, as we prepare to celebrate the biggest birthday ever, the birthday of Jesus Christ, um, on uh, December, uh, we know that indeed the king is coming again and again. But these scriptures today from the prophet Isaiah is also a, 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 a statement to that same fact that the king is coming. Um, it is chapter 64 of Isaiah. Uh, you know, Isaiah was a prophet. The, the job of a prophet is to foretell stuff, to tell what is yet to take place. And, and, and sometimes the prophet will link what is coming to what is happening right now. And so uh, Isaiah is one of those famous, uh, famous, uh, very popular prophets of his time, and indeed of all times. Um, it, when the Lord Jesus was born, at the beginning of his ministry, he did say that John the Baptist uh, was one of a kind. <laughs> and the Lord seems to have elevated the role of John the Baptist beyond any other prophet uh, who came sent by God to minister to the people of God. But definitely Isaiah is a prophet never to be minimized or ignored. The impact of the prophecies of Isaiah is widely known amongst the community of the believers. Um, and so as you listen to the reading and the commentary of this chapter 64, uh, this prophecy, you will hear uh, God speaking uh, to, to the people at that time, and you will hear um, the, a, a direct relationship of the words that are coming out of Isaiah uh, to Jesus Christ who was born many, many years after this prophecy was proclaimed. And you will also hear in this same prophecy um, things that the Lord Jesus himself referred to, uh, things that Jesus himself also uh, prophesied about, kind of revitalizing the prophecy of Isaiah as it is oftentimes the case uh, with what Jesus spoke during his ministry. And so you, you, will, you will be able to create some links or some relationship uh, even to what is happening today in Holy Land, in Israel, uh, Palestine, Israel, uh, and, and what Israel really has been going through as a nation. Um, and so, yeah, let us, as I read, you, you have, of course, you are free to, uh, to read along from your own Bible translation, as long as you remain muted, so there's no interference here on the Zoom transmission. Here is the reading of the word of God. And I am reading the translation that I'm using is 
the African American Jubilee edition is one of my favorite. <laughs> I have many favorites, but this one is, is one of them. And so this is what the word says from verse one through verse 12, which is really the entire chapter 64 of the book of Isaiah. Rip the heavens apart. Come down, Lord. Make the mountains tremble. Be a spark that starts a fire, causing water to boil. And then your enemies will know who you are. All nations will tremble because you are nearby. Your fearsome deeds have completely amazed us. Even the mountains shake when you come down. You are the only God ever seen or heard of who works miracles for his followers. You help all who gladly obey and do what you want, but sin makes you angry. Only by your help can we ever be saved. We are unfit to worship you. Each of our good deeds is merely a filthy rag. We dry up like leaves. Our sins are storm winds sweeping us away. No one worships in your name or remains faithful. You have turned your back on us and let our sins melt, melt us away. You have turned your back on us and let our sins melt us away. Verse 8 says, You, Lord, are our Father. We are nothing but clay, but you are the pot who molded us. Don't be so furious or keep our sins in your thoughts forever. Remember that all of us are your people. Every one of your towns has turned into a desert. Especially Jerusalem. Zion's glorious and holy temples where our ancestors pray, where our ancestors praised you, has been destroyed by fire. Our beautiful buildings are now a pile of ruins. When you see these things, how can you just sit there and make us suffer more? Oh my Lord, did you just hear that word? <laughs> <laughs> so now we're gonna we're gonna go back uh we're gonna go back slowly and try to uh you know try to digest this word uh, we're gonna try to to make sense of of this word it is a very simple word but very very much direct and practical and so and like i said at the beginning uh, you know, it touches so many things of the past and present, while it also still pretty much remain a prophecy, meaning things that are yet to come, yet to be revealed, yet to take place. Some of these prophecies uh, uh, may have already taken place, but certainly um, other sections of the same scripture speak to prophecies that are taking place now and it will take place in the future. And that's what our prophecy is all about. The prophecy does not always make sense at the time that it is delivered because um, it does not only speak um, or necessarily speak about what is taking place at the time or what has taken place in the past. The prophecy, while it may make reference of the past and present events, uh, it is 
it is its main focus, main message is to what will unfold, will, 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 will unfold uh, uh, in a later at, at a later time. So you know, uh, the 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 prophet here has the pro has has the privilege of being invited by God uh, in a variety of ways. It's not always the same way. God always, you know, communicates uh, with us in a variety of ways. And God definitely communicates, communicated these messages uh, to these prophets of the past in a, in a host of styles. Uh, you know, and 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 context and occasions, but the main thing to retain is that God is present at all time. God sees what is taking place, and yes, God does have a say uh, to what is taking place, and ultimately, like the word of God says, God does have. The last what? The last word, right? <laughs> the rest of us can do or undo or uh, act and behave in whichever way. But in the end, the Lord will speak. And when God speaks, nobody can say that. That's what. That's what the word of God says. God retains the power of the last say in any situation. Um, so now the prophet here, in his uh, special advantage point and a place of honor that God places him. <coughs> Excuse me. So the, the prophet Isaiah speaks with God. It's like he's dialoguing with God. When you read what is written, some of it sounds like it is the prophet himself speaking to God, praying to God, pleading with God, petitioning God uh, for the favors that are mentioned here. In another instance, the prophet, when you read uh, his words, it sounds like it is God now talking, talking uh, to us. In other instances, and, and that's where you will find a, a relationship with Jesus, um, it will sound or appear like, since now we, we who live in this era of Christianity, after the birth of the one that they had been waiting for for ages, uh, Christ the Messiah. So we can we can hear the pronouncements of these prophecies of the Old Testament differently, and make a whole lot more sense, and be able to link and relate that, connect that with the person and the ministry of Jesus Christ more easily than the audience at the time when these prophecies were delivered, you see? And so, and we can, we can also um, more easily make a direct connection to what Jesus said himself and to what Jesus himself did as a fulfillment of these prophecies of the Old Testament in general. And that's why Jesus himself say that he did not come to cancel, to erase the, the first testament, the first covenant, or the law that God had given uh, to his people on the Old Testament. Jesus said, I did not come to contradict or to cancel or to reject that. As a matter of fact, Jesus uh, continued, I came to fulfill those promises that you read about 
from, from the Old Testament scriptures. Everything you have been taught about, everything you learned about, uh, uh, about God uh, from the Holy Bible, the Holy Book, I came to fulfill that. See, the birth of Christ itself, it is a fulfillment of those promises, prophecies that uh, for the most part, they all pointed to what Christ was going to come and do. Now, we who live after Christ uh, has come and done what he did and so forth, it, it's, it's very easy for us to, you know, to make that relationship. But you got to think about the people who received these prophecies at the time uh, 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 when, when, when they had no clue when Christ was was going to be born, how exactly he was he was to come to the world and all of that. So it, it was very difficult. <clears throat> so we, the faithful community of the, the, the era after Christ was born, uh, in that sense, we are more, we are more favored. We are, you know, we are in advantage of uh, 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 easily making that connection and understanding. Now, look at that verse three. I mean, uh, uh, beginning really from verse one of, of chapter 60, 64. Um, Rip the heavens apart. Rip the heavens apart. Come down, Lord. Make the mountains tremble. Be a spark that starts a fire, causing water to boil. Then your enemies will know who you are. All nations will tremble because you are nearby. <laughs> you see? So those verses 1 and 2, um, those verses, it is the prophet himself who is speaking those words to God. In a way, if you pay attention to what he implies, what he means by, by, by those statements, um, when he says, rip the heavens apart, come down, Lord. Who can rip the heavens apart? <laughs> can you rip the heavens apart? <laughs> can I rip? None of us can rip the heavens apart. So when he says, Rip the heavens apart. That suggests the fact that, I mean, speaks to the fact that the Lord that he is talking to, the God that he is talking to, is indeed a mighty God, a powerful God, someone unlike any other who has an absolute authority and power over everything that is and exists. That that spot can only be filled by no other but God. If God put together the heavens, of course, God has the power to rip the heavens apart. <laughs> you know, one who builds up can also destroy. You see, so God has put together the heavens and the earth, and God retains the absolute power over that which God has created. He can rip it apart. Now, why is the prophet telling God uh, to rip uh, the heavens apart? Does, 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 does Isaiah really mean for God to come here and rip the heavens apart? Let's look at the reason that he invokes here on verse 2. He says, be a spark that starts a fire, causing water to boil. Then your enemies will know who you are. All nations will tremble because you are nearby. Huh? Do you do you hear what I'm hearing there? <laughs> so, uh, is this is not a, just an is not an invitation for this divine power that we call God to come and destroy what God has created. Um, I, 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 I feel like Isaiah here is magnifying the Lord. 
Isaiah is recognizing God as one who is of absolute power. And Isaiah is also making a contract with those who are uh, either by word or action, behavior and attitude, seemingly in contradiction with God. Some kind of challenging the natural order and the positive moral order that God has intended and has created. And so, in contrast to these negative forces of, of nature and humanity, this negative power that negatively interferes with our lives, the prophet is given a vision, the knowledge and the wisdom to see in God someone who is absolutely powerful and capable of destroying what he has created, someone um, who, whose presence here where we stand causes that which God has created to tremble, to shake, to be unstable, to be uncomfortable even, because the mastermind, the creator, the heaven honor himself is here. So now the presence of God here uh, 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 by Isaiah is not taken lightly. It's not just like, oh, pastors here, you know, few people might uh, uh, adjust themselves or what, but you know, that's it, that's nothing. <laughs> but when you say the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of the universe is here, definitely everything is gonna move. You see, the mountains will shake, meaning the, 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 when, when he makes a reference of mountains that shake because of God's presence, that speaks also to the mighty power of God because physically and tangibly speaking, no one can cause the mountain to shake. <laughs> you can go for your little hand and touch just one small portion of a mountain, you know? Uh, you, you, you can't, you, it's impossible. You can't, you can't even push it or anything, you know, it's there. If you bump it, it's you who's gonna get destroyed, but the mountain remains on its place. Now, on the contrast, the prophet is saying, your presence God here is gonna cause the mountain to shake and the earth will tremble. Everything yes, will feel manifest and speak to your presence. And this was demonstrated if you remember the stories of Moses, um, uh, you, you, you will remember the, the physical demonstration of what the Bible is talking about. You know, there's a lot of talk about mountains. Uh, Moses went on top of the mountain and the people down who, that he left down here, the crowd, you know, uh, when they were in trouble, they would always begin to question and to doubt this divine power a uh, uh, God that they worship, the God of the ancestors, God of Abraham, blah, blah, blah. So they, they, whenever they would get in trouble, their faith towards this God will be a little bit shaken. So they will begin to a little bit doubt, uh, a little bit or even a, a lot more. And so, and sometimes in their uh, ignorance, uh, the best of their ignorance, they would literally demand God to be there. You know, if this God is real, and I mean, let, let, let him just show up here. Uh, let, let, we, yeah, we wanna see this God. <laughs> yeah, show us this God. And now, um, when Moses would provide all these reports, not that God did not know what was happening, but Moses had to report, you know, the chain of command, you have to report to your supervisor, to your superior. And so, Moses was acting under supervision and, and under the command of God. So whatever uh, Moses came across, whatever battles uh, Moses confronted, he had to take those 
uh, to God that sent him. And now at some point, God said, okay, so these people want to see me, huh? All right. <laughs> okay, tell the people that I'm coming. <laughs> you know, God will announce uh, 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 and, and, and the people will be informed and everybody will be excited. They want to see God, you know. <laughs> They want to see the, 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 the one that no one can see. They want to see. They are demanding to see God. And God will show up. First, it will be a strong wave of uh, a windstorm, uh, you know, passing by, uh, taking down with it everything, everything that is strong, taking it down. Yeah. And the people would fear. They wouldn't celebrate. Like, oh, yeah, the Lord is here. Hallelujah. No, they, they would tremble, you know, and, and almost bury themselves to the ground. And they would scream to Moses again, tell this God of yours to get out of here. We don't want him. We, no, no, we don't want to see him anymore. Tell him to go back. Because the, the strong windstorm was blowing and taking everything down and shaking the noise, the thunderstorm and all of that. They were terrified. And then the word came and say, well, God was not really there. <laughs> and then another thing comes. I mean, it was a chain of little events <laughs> that caused some type of uh, 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 a minimum physical reaction. And the human being couldn't take that because the earth will tremble. Nothing can hold God. You see? God does not fit anywhere in our little boxes. And so they scream to Moses. And they're, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. But no, we don't want this God anymore. Tell him to go back to his place. <laughs> but they were the ones who were making noise, screaming and demanding that they wanted to see God. So the fact that um, the, the God can rip even the heavens apart, the fact that mountains can tremble in the presence of God. The, 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 the fact that God can be the spark that starts a fire causing water to boil. Which simply means that this fire is really, really a real fire. You know, water doesn't just boil. <laughs> then then that will be enough for the enemies of God, these negative forces that stand against God and all the agents that are lined up with such forces. Then your enemies will know who you are, O oh God. And all nations in this world will tremble because you are not here but nearby. Now, this language of nearby, what does that remind you as we prepare to welcome the birthday of Jesus, another birthday of Jesus? Mm -hmm. uh, the nearby. Remember, John the Baptist, whose mission was to prepare the way for Christ, prepare the minds of the people, uh, and to try to put the, 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 the people ready for Christ. Uh, and he was telling the people that he himself was not Christ, but uh, 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 but he was preaching, repent from your sins because the kingdom of God is near. It's near. It's almost here. It's nearby. And now the prophet Isaiah talking about God is, is saying um, mountains will tremble. Even the, the strongest hills will shake. <laughs> the earth will tremble. The nations and the people from all over the world, everybody, everything will shake and tremble because you, O oh God, are near, are near the area, are nearby. You're not even here, but you are near. And John the Baptist say, repent, because the kingdom of God is near. What about Jesus himself when he started his mission? Do you remember? When, when, when Jesus began to preach after the 40 days and 40 nights uh, at the desert, temp 
being tempted by the uh, the enemy, Satan, and all of that, he came and he started his mission officially. And his first sermons were falling in line with what the one that was sent to prepare his way and his coming was saying. It was almost like the same sermon. You know, uh, don't you see that sometimes a pastor comes and preach, goes away, another pastor comes and preach the same the same sermon <laughs> from the same scripture, even sometimes the same sermon topic. See, the message is always the same. There's nothing new, it's the same. But it sounds new every time for sure, but it's the same message. So Jesus did the same thing when he started preaching too and teaching the people. He was like, um, repent for the kingdom of, of God is near. Kingdom of God is near. But in reality, the kingdom of God was already present with the people because Jesus Christ is the kingdom of God. God is his own kingdom. Where God is, the kingdom of God is right there. And, you know, as Christians, uh, according to our theology and the doctrine, we talk of God uh, who is Father, God who is Son, God who is Holy Spirit. So whether you say uh, where the Father is, all the divine family is there together. They are inseparable. You can't you can't dissociate these people. And uh, where the, the the God the Son of God, uh, who is also known as God the Son or Jesus Christ, uh, where Jesus Christ is present, the Father is there, the Holy Spirit is there, the entire uh, uh, divine family is present. You know, um, uh, when, when Christ um, uh, ministers to the people, uh, it is really God that is ministering to those people. Uh, when, when Christ delivers us from our sin, it is really God that is delivering us from our misery. And so, um, and, 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 and Jesus being present means that the kingdom of God was entirely there, present. But Jesus too used the same language. Same language that prophet Isaiah here is, is using, nearby. John the Baptist was using just before Jesus started. John the Baptist was preaching the same message. Said, the kingdom of, of God is nearby, it's, it's coming close, it's right around the corner. Uh, you need to do just one thing to enter it. Uh, repent of your sins and move in a new direction. Now, um, let us continue to, 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 to listen to this statement um, uh, from, from John the Baptist. On verse three, he says, your fearsome deeds, he's still talking to God. He says, your fearsome deeds have completely amazed us. Even the mountains shake when you come down. You are the only God ever seen or heard of who works miracles uh, for his followers. So you see now the truth is coming. And the truth is this confession that uh, uh, the prophet Isaiah is is. Is, is confessing to God. He is he is praising God. You know, he's manifesting and 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 expressing um, uh, uh, this glory, the glory of God. It's, it's, it's impossible to to describe uh, to put the glory of God in words. So, the prophet Isaiah has been given a place of honor, a place of privilege to interact with God. And, 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 and he's saying these things. He is praising God. He is speaking his admiration for who God is, what God is capable of, how incomparable God is to anybody else. He is making it clear in, in his worship here and his praise here that God is one of a kind, <laughs> and there is none like God. Now, on verse four, and on verse 
on verse five, he says, you help all who gladly obey and do what you want. He's saying that to God. Say, so you are the kind of God who help all the people who choose to obey you gladly. And they choose to do what you or God want, not what other people want. You see, in this world, it's very difficult. <laughs> Life in this world is it's, it's really harsh. It's a temptation every time. Because you are always confronted with those two choices. To choose to be a follower of fellow humans and let them guide and direct your steps, your thoughts, and your life which most likely will end in hell. Or choose to obey God, stand with God, and follow God's will, which in itself will cause you or put you in enmity with the rest. You see, when you choose to intentionally stand with your God, to try to do the right thing on the eyes of God, you will bring and attract upon yourself a large host of enemies. <laughs> and you will ask yourself, what wrong have I done? <laughs> no, you did wrong because you went against the will of, uh, 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 of people and you chose to go with God and you're going to get uh, 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 you're gonna get a, a, a big, a big reaction. And how about Jesus Himself? Yes, is he, Jesus was no exception to that rule. True. And Jesus really had no choice. You know, uh, he had to do the will of his Father. Something we all should do, but we we are failures oftentimes and always. We are we we fail to go and to align our lives with God because we want to please our friends and, and our, our peers, you know, our fellow humans. And we, we you know, we wanna go along with our peers and we, we, we are okay breaking uh, uh, the will of God. But Jesus did not have that choice. He, he had to choose to follow his father's will uh, from the beginning to the end. As a result of that, you know what happened. He was bullied. Um, uh, you know, he was uh, uh, he was talked cheap about. Uh, his reputation was ruined. He was physically uh, aggressed, attacked physically uh, to the point of death. Uh, and all of that because he chose to stand with God and to only follow what is right on the sight of God. And so, so when, when Isaiah on, on verse 5 says, you help all who gladly obey and want, gladly obey and, and do what you want, but sin makes you angry. You see, the prophet is telling God that, you know, uh, I know that sin makes you angry. Uh, as good God is, when you come to sin, then it's impossible to, to reconcile because uh, it's like light and darkness. Uh, you could be in the middle of darkness, but once you turn on that flashlight, even if it's just flashlight, then uh, at least up to the power and the range that your flashlight uh, can cover, certainly there will be no single darkness there because the two can't mix, they don't mix. You can't have light and darkness together in the same space. Impossible. You have either one or the other. And so uh, definitely sin is darkness. Uh, and that's how we physically characterize and symbolize it. We give the image of darkness to sin and the image of God to light. Uh, and so uh, a God does not mix up with sin. Uh, they, they are not associates, they are not friends, and they don't get along at all. They don't, not even a bit. You either have one thing 
or the other, but not both. Sin makes you angry, says the prophet Isaiah. That's verse five. Only by your help can we ever be saved. Yeah. Now, do you hear what, what he's, he's, the prophet is, is doing there? <laughs> First, he recognized the fact that God does not mix up with sin. Every time we commit sin, we, sep we are separated with God. And the only way we could ever make it to heaven is if God himself could save us. You see? And that's where Christ comes to play the role of fulfilling that prayer uh, 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 that the prophet was making there. We are unfit even to worship you. That's verse, that's verse 6. We are still on chapter 64 of the book of Isaiah, in case you, you signed in late. Verse 6 says, we are unfit to worship you. Each of our good deeds is merely a filthy rug. We dry up like leaves. Our sins are storm winds, sweeping us away. In other words, it is really impossible for us to save ourselves. Why? Because of our sin. Why is our sin a problem? Because you cannot mix together light and darkness. You cannot put together God and devil. God represents everything that is morally uh, uh, socially, politically, economically, and humanly good, fair, and righteous, while as sin represents everything that uh, is, is negative, bad, evil, hurtful, and that brings blood and death into our lives in so many ramifications of it. For that reason, the prophet concludes, we can only be saved by you, O oh God. You are the only one who can save us. No one, that's verse 7, no one worships in your name or remains faithful. Uh, you have turned your back on us and let our sins melt us away. That is so true. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 it is fake to think that God never gets upset. Uh, it is false to think of God as some kind of a yes pop, yes yes daddy or yes mama, <laughs> a yes grandma, yes grandpa all the time. No, no, God is not a, 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 a yes 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 all the time. Uh, God will say yes when he has to say yes, but God will also say no, and and God. Um, uh, will punish us even to death you know uh, according to the overwhelming evidence that we find both in the Old and New Testament uh, so God is not a fantasy God is not fake uh, God is not something that we just imagine God is real he's a real being um uh, a divine being that we cannot even humanly describe, or accurately describe. Because every time we try to tell who God is, we miss the point. Uh, it's like, you know, it's like a, 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 a big, large, huge um, uh, elephant. Now you stand in one advantage point to observe it. It's larger than you, right? I'm just giving a very small, insignificant example. <laughs> so now, as big as you are, you're never going to be as big as the elephant. <laughs> Even the newborn elephant is huge. <laughs> you can't compare it with a goat, a sheep, a pig. Or, uh, it's, it's huge. Now, uh, imagine a, gr a fully grown, big, really big, large elephant. And you are standing there side by side with the elephant. Certainly, you are at a certain particular advantage point. What you will describe to be what the elephant is, is simply what your eyes can manage to see from that angle where you stand beside that huge, impossible uh, animal. So you may say, oh, if you are if standing near the tail, 
you might say, ooh, elephant. <laughs> you will give all the description that you can of the tail that you see. If you are standing by the side of the ear, all you see is just the ear of the elephant and you're gonna just write books and books that this is the elephant, I know the elephant. You are just talking about one ear of it. You will never be able to fully capture the essence of it. That's just small insignificant example. Now imagine our God who, uh, who put everything that we can imagine of including the endless oceans, uh, the endless seas that just come and go, uh, the, 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 the most famous rivers, even the small lakes, you know, that people canoe in and all of, you cannot fully grasp it. So how could you uh, think of fully grasping God? We can't. But, you know, we know a little bit about God and we celebrate that God has allowed us a little window uh, as he revealed himself so that we can see. Um, uh, it's, the, it's like people who, who go to watch uh, these, these huge animals uh, from, from, from the seas and, 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 and so forth. Uh, when, when, when that, when that uh, uh, animal sh you know, shows itself to people, maybe by jumping a little bit up and down again. And then you get to take your pictures and you're like, ooh, this, this is huge animal in the, you know, in the sea, in a huge animal. And, uh, and, uh, and you are just admiring. But even those who have scientifically gone through research with binoculars and, and then to, to, to spend a little bit more time in depth of the water, studying and capturing and studying the behavior and, placing cameras underground on the water uh, and deep seas and to capture and to study. And then they, 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 they print all these beautiful pictures that we read and see to give us some idea of what's happening inside the ocean. You know, even that is not enough to teach us enough about that particular, uh, those particular animals uh, that they're researching and sharing their research findings with us. How could I ever think that just because I'm some kind of a pastor who spent a couple of years in the seminar studying <laughs> and all of a sudden begin to think that I know God fully and I can tell uh, everybody about God. No, we, don't. we only know uh, the little bit that God has revealed himself to us. And that is enough for us to capture the faith that will lead us to salvation. You see, now on verse, on verse eight, the, the, the prophet says, you Lord are our father. We are nothing but clay. I like this verse. It's one of the popular ones. Uh, people make songs, singers write songs and sing about it. We are nothing but clay, but you are the potter uh, who molded us, you see. Think of that. I mean, this prophet really, uh, uh, the spirit of God was upon him. There was no way Isaiah as a human being could have uh, uh, entered to this space that he was in uh, to be able to understand, perceive, and you know, speak to God and share with us this knowledge about God in the manner that he is doing it here, unless the Holy Spirit himself was leading God to do that. Impossible. You know, how would Isaiah have known all these things about God? It's so truthful. We are the clay. We are the, we are the material. And God is the mastermind, you know, who, 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 who puts us together. And so, I mean, we are fragile. You let go of it. Once it hits the floor, the concrete breaks apart into pieces. But the one who made it in the first place, the porter, has the ability to collect the pieces. <laughs> you know, he can unmold them. 
Mm? You can undo it and redo redo everything again and put again a beautiful uh, something artistic. That's who we are. And I, I really agree with this description here that Isaiah is using. I mean, if you look at, at yourself in this manner and you understand who God is in this manner, and then you will be able to have some security, some sense of safety in your heart. Knowing that it's not about me, it's not because of what I can do. I am just a little fragile material that, you know, and I break all the time, but God, thanks be to God, God keeps putting me together. <laughs> you know, have you had people, maybe friends or family, who say, oh, my life is all over. My life is falling apart. <laughs> yeah. And and, and then so eventually say, oh, my life is coming together again. Yeah, I feel like my life yeah, is, you know, is coming together. The Lord is putting my life back together again. And then you feel better, like you are in a better place again. God is really the potter, and we are just clay. And I love all those songs that they write about this. Verse 9 says, don't be so furious. It's Isaiah talking to God, remember? Don't be so furious or keep our sins in your thoughts forever. Remember that all of us are your people. I love that verse. The prophet here, led by the Holy Spirit, is speaking to God that God do not keep our sins, our failures, our brokenness, our darkness in your thoughts forever. Because if that happens, that means we will never ever be saved. Let go of our sins, O oh God, in other words. <laughs> and remember that we all are your people. I love this. All of us are your people. Not just the Jewish people that were known to be the people of God at that time. and da, 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 uh -uh. Not just Abraham, the chosen one. Uh -uh. Not just all these people we read about in the Bible, even in the New Testament. You know, Matthew, Luke, John, da, da, no, 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 no. All of us means all of the human family, entire humanity. Doesn't matter where you were born. Doesn't matter where you were listening from. We are all God's children. And that's powerful. We are all your people, oh God. Everyone of your towns has turned into a desert. Now, now, now we're going to Jerusalem. Pay attention there. <laughs> That's verse 10, by the way. Every one of your towns has turned into a desert, especially Jerusalem. Uh-huh. And you know, ever since that prophecy of Jesus about Jerusalem, when he was entering the, uh, the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, remember? Remember Jesus said with his own mouth uh, that uh, no single stone on this robust walls mm -hmm. there will be no single stone left on top of the other meaning the structure will be total hmm. zion's glorious and holy temple where our where our ancestors praised you has been destroyed by fire our beautiful buildings are now a pile of ruins don't tears just come out of your eyes when you hear this prophecy and you see what Jerusalem, uh, Israel, and Palestine is going, is going through right now, you know. But remember, this is not just about that uh, limited geographical physical space in, in Israel and Palestine. It's really, remember, th this group of people are, were uh, intended to be a representation of our entire humankind. And so these ashes, these destructions of the top buildings being destroyed, in reality, as you know, is not just taking place in Israel. It's taking place, and it has been taking place throughout humanity, uh, beyond Ukraine, uh, beyond across Africa, uh, 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 Europe, I mean, uh, it's it's really all of us here. This prophecy is about all of us. Amen. 
Don't make the mistake of thinking, oh, this is about Jerusalem. Uh, no, no, no. It's 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 a symbolic representation of all of us. Verse 11 and 12. Zion's glorious and holy temple, where our ancestors praised you, has been destroyed by fire. Our beautiful buildings are now a pile of ruins. When you see these things, how can you just sit there and make us suffer more? This is the, the, the last verse of that chapter uh, 64, and our time is up. But boy, I mean, don't, don't, don't that last verse resonate with you, if anything else? The prophet is led by the Holy Spirit to speak to God, saying, are you just going to sit there, O oh God? And watch us melt down like this. Aren't you going to do something? In other words, this is a prayer now. He started with prayer and praise and worship on verses 1 to 4. And now he's closing this prophecy with a prayer again. But this time, he's not just... Um, talking about scary stuff that when you come near here, everything's going to tremble, the mountains and uh, all the nations will tremble, shake, afraid because of your a presence nearby, not even here, but around, just near in the neighborhood. But now the Holy Spirit is directing the mouth of the prophet Isaiah to do a prayer for redemption for the humankind. He said, Lord, God, Holy One, are you just going to sit there and watch all this misery in the human family? Do you think any of us could rescue ourselves? Could any human save another human? Isn't it true that it only takes the upper hand, the divine power, the hand of God himself to rescue us, to deliver us from our own mess that we have put our own selves into because of our sin, which is the choice to disobey the will of God and choose to go with one another's will, which lands up in a disaster. Oh my God, I, I really love this ending of this uh, scripture today. It ends with a prayer. So my friends, I, I would like to bless you before I let you go, our time's up. Let us let us pray again. Let us let us pray. Lord, are you just gonna sit there and watch us, the fruits of our labor? Are you just gonna sit there, O oh God, on your throne of mighty and power and glory, and watch us, your people, your children? whether here in America, in Europe, be it in Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, Gaza, be it in Africa, wherever there is a bloodshed, are you just going to sit there and watch us sink? Whether this speaks to somebody's illness, physical, mental illness, whether this is just about an emotional distress, Lord, are you just going to sit there and watch us die? Please forgive us. Forgive our sins, Lord. Make us holy as you are holy. Purify our intentions. Purify our hearts. Repair our minds, Lord, so we can think the right thing. Fix our hearts so we can desire and be passionate for something positive, something constructive and good. Direct our actions, Lord, so we can do the right thing that brings you on and glory. Lord, help us shape our attitudes 
shape our behavior. Place in us a desire to know you, to follow you, and to live according to your will. That's all we are asking tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, your Holy Son, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you, beloved. May God bless you and may God bless your family. I will see you on Sunday and uh, I really look forward uh, uh, to see you in person at the church uh, the, uh, this Sunday and every Sunday. God bless you. Good night. Buenas noches. Mm-hmm. <laughs>